Chapter 7 The Surprise And I lay and wondered for a long time, because it took the miners many years to find me. You will see how this was when I tell you that they had to build a city to come to me. Yes, they built a great underground city, streets and avenues, car tracks, stables for the horses, and even street lights down there in the coal measure where I lay hidden. Yes, there where my mother tree had stood in the forest with other great trees and where the dangerous river had rushed. Now there were dim underground streets and men and boys and horses working together, but it was a very long time before I heard the sound of their pickaxes. It was just when I had begun to think that for once the sun had been mistaken and the miners would never break away through to me that I suddenly heard a far-off knocking. The knocking came nearer and nearer through days and days. It was as though the miners were knocking on doors and doors in a long corridor between them and me. As each far-off door was opened, the knocking grew louder and surer. But when it had come very near, I knew that it was digging and chipping and the following of great heaps of coal that I was hearing. And then, at last, one morning, I heard men's voices. I was very much excited, I can tell you, for now that my long life in the ground was almost over, I could hardly bear to wait. At last, the point of a pickaxe found me, and out I came, rolling down with dozens of my brothers, and tumbled into a street in that underground city. I lay where I had fallen, and looked about me. I saw that we coals were of many different sizes, but that I was the smallest of all. I had been squeezed, and pressed, and heated, and rubbed almost into nothing. I was just a little black stone, but some of my brothers were so large that the man with the light in his cap could not lift them at all. I thought that that man was the most marvelous thing I had ever seen. And yet I was a bit disappointed too, for his face and hands were as black as I was, and he did not stand straight and tall like a tree, but was bent over, and strangely thin and twisted. But in spite of that, he was free of the earth. His feet did not grow into the ground, as trees do. He moved about wherever he cared to go. He was whistling as he worked. But suddenly, he stopped whistling, and scratched his head. Even I, who knew nothing of the ways of men, could see plainly enough that he was bothered about something. He was looking up towards the roof of the street, muttering, What was the trouble there? I too looked up. Then I forgot all about the miner. My brother Coles, and the underground city, for I was looking at something I had never hoped to see again. Can you guess what it was? Oh, no, no. How could we guess what could be of such great interest to you down in that dirty mine, cried the coal scuttle. Do get on with your story before it is forever too late. See, the fire is certainly getting very low, and the biggest little boy has been looking over his shoulder 
as though he knew he ought to mend it. Do hurry. Hurry, the sun's wisdom never taught me, said the little rough black coal. I must go on in my own way, and if I do not manage to get to the end before I am used in mending the fire, well, you have only to ask some other little black coal to finish it for you, for my story is only the story of my brothers. At least all of it is the same as theirs, except the bit I am going to tell you now. Of course this wonderful thing could not happen to all of us. Go on, please, murmured the fire screen. What did you see up there, above you in the underground street? Well, it is one of the strangest things that ever happened. But towering there in the street, and disappearing up through the roof stood my mother. The things gasped. There was a surprise for them indeed. How thrilling for the little coal. But the blue rug was not satisfied. She had to understand a thing to believe it. Towering above you, she cried. How could that be, little coal? Wasn't this miles and miles underground? And had not the forest where your mother had grown been buried and turned into coal long and ever so long ago? And who ever heard of a tree standing to such a great age? And even if she could have lived those ages, how could she stand up underground without being crushed and worn down, even as you were worn down into the little black stone you are? Well, that is exactly what I want to explain to you, said the little coal, laughing. For the blue rug, in spite of all her learning, and good sense could be rather funny. Chapter 8 Little Cole's Journey My mother was one of the strongest and finest trees that ever grew. The floods and the sands and the mud had settled around her higher and higher, and then at last when a final earthquake came, she had been covered up altogether, but she still stood. She had been changed, of course. Nothing lives at all without changing. Time and the loss of all her cones, the stoppage of the sap in her limbs, those things had changed her to a hollow trunk of charred, black bark, then the rivers bringing sand to the sea, slowly filled her hollow trunk with sand that hardened into stone. But long ago, her trunk had hardened into coal. Still, she stood, straight and brave as ever, only now she was a coal tree. The miner knew about such trees. He may have heard of them from other miners, or perhaps he had seen one himself. He knew that it would not be at all easy for him to get at the coal that made her trunk, for at any minute, once he should begin striking it with his pickaxe, the whole thing might topple over upon him and kill him. That was why he was now muttering to himself, and scratching his head. It was only a little of my mother that I could see, of course, for she stood straight up through the roof of the street. But I knew well enough that she was my mother. After hundreds of thousands of years, here was I lying at her feet and peering up through the dimness. I called out to her, and even after all those ages, she had not forgotten my voice. This is how she answered my glad cry. 
You waved high in my arms, little cone, long and long ago. Do you remember the warm rains and the wild winds and the sun? Do you remember my songs? Some of them were just for you, because you were my littlest, and I held you farthest up towards the sun. Now all that I spoke then about, the plan's promise for us, is coming true. Soon we shall blossom into fire. It is well that we have been patient, but after we have blossomed into fire, I cried up to her, What of us then? My mother laughed. It was her same old windy laughter, and it came down to me strangely in the dust and dimness. How can I tell what then? She said. The sun tells us more and more all the time, but never everything at once. When you were a little cone, and I held you up to the sun for heat and light and wisdom. The plan was working even then, working towards making us coal. Now the plan is moving us towards our blossoming into fire. But what shall become of us after that service to man? Only the plan can tell. So after all these ages, my mother was still talking about the plan. But just then, as she said the last words, I was picked up and tossed into a basket, already half full of my brothers. Other coals came knocking about my head, and settling down on me. And again I lost sight of my mother. Goodbye, goodbye, I cried. Goodbye for a while, she answered, in her windy, wise voice. The little black rough coal came to a pause in his story and grew thoughtful. Go on, go on, urged the coal scuttle. The biggest little boy over by the window is looking our way again. It is getting very chilly. It was true, and the biggest little boy would most certainly have turned to mending the fire that very minute, had not the littlest little girl screamed and pointed to something especially funny down in the street at that minute. The biggest little boy flattened his nose against the pane again, and the coal went on with his story. The basket where we had been thrown was tipped up and emptied into a little car on wheels. Other baskets were soon emptied over us, and when the car was full of us, we suddenly felt that we were moving. We were being drawn along by a pony. A pony down there underground asked the tall old clock. Well, you may wonder, but it is true enough, said the little coal. There are hundreds of ponies in that great underground city. They are taken down in the cages like the miners, but unlike the miners, they never come up again. The miners go up to their homes every night, up to the free air, where they can see the stars. But the ponies go to sleep in stables, built for them, right in the coal underground. Oh, how dreadful, sighed the red china dog on the hearth. At the beginning, he had promised himself not to interrupt the story. But this was too much, and he forgot. I'd rather be a red china dog stuck here on this pokey hearth, but in light of day, than a prancing live pony down there in the dark mine. Well, you may say so, agreed the little black coal. Chapter 9. The Nursery Fire. But how do the men and horses down in the mine breathe? asked the blue rug. Men and animals have to have air. They are not like things. Oh, 
They have air down in the mine, said the little coal. Only, of course, it is not fresh and clean like the air above ground. A great fire in an enormous furnace is kept burning night and day at the foot of the shaft. That keeps the air always moving, for hot air rises, and other air must come in to take its place. When our cart of coal reached that furnace, and I saw its great door yawning, I was troubled indeed. Am I to be thrown into this fire? And so end my days without seeing the upper world after all, I thought. But no, we were dumped helter skelter into the cage that was waiting at the bottom of the shaft. So we were to go up. I was overjoyed. I was at the top of the load in the cage. And so it happened. That I saw the light of day growing brighter and brighter as we shot up. There was one strange thought that kept with me all the way. It was of how, now, in a few minutes of time, we were rushing up through layers of earth and stone and coal that had taken hundreds of thousands of years to harden. We were shooting up through hundreds of dead forest, packed one on top of another, and all in a minute. At the top, we were thrown out into a cloud of black smoke. The sun there, through the smoke at the mouth of the mine, looked something as it had looked, seen through the steam and the mist of the old days when I was a little cone. Tossed in the wind. Only it was not so fiery red, and I could not see that it moved at all. I said to my brothers, It is not so strange as we thought it would be, is it? But before they could answer, we were dumped into another and larger car. This time I was at the bottom. Now we were carried along much faster than the ponies had drawn us in the mine, for it was a great steam engine. That was drawing us. At the end of that journey, we were thrown into a storehouse, packed as close, almost, as we had been in the coal measures. And it was just as dark. We were sorry not to be seeing more of the world. Then at last, one day, we were tumbled out into the light again. And here we are, our long journey through the ages and towards the light is nearly ended. Soon we are to make light ourselves, not just see it. We are here to blossom in this fire. To make those children warm. But what a sorry end, sighed the coal scuttle smugly. Perhaps it is a sorry end, but I don't think so, said the little rough black coal. My mother, remember, said goodbye only for a while, and she had much wisdom from the sun. So do not waste your pity. Or your scorn, little scuttle. Little, cried the coal scuttle, I am fifty times as big and bright as you. Don't little me, little coal. I beg your pardon for calling you little if it troubles you so to be reminded of it, scuttle, said the coal, not unkindly. But of course we are both little if it comes to that. And I, for my part, can see no harm in it. It isn't the size, but the wisdom that matters. The coal is right, said the tall old clock, and I am sure that we all thank him for the story of himself that he has told us. It is only a pity 
that the children over there could not hear or understand, since it is for them he has taken this long journey through time. Perhaps they have other ways in which they may learn it, suggested the little coal. How can we be sure that our way of telling a story is the only way? May it not be that they speak to each other and understand as we do? The scuttle laughed at that. What a dreamer you are, little coal, he cried. Of course we know well enough that only things can talk and tell a tale. Any other idea is so silly. Who knows that? Who knows? mused the tall old clock, and a silence fell in the nursery. Chapter 10 The Singing Coal After all, it was not the biggest little boy who mended the fire. He had forgotten all about it in his amusement at the pranks the wind was playing with people and hats and umbrellas in the street below. The room would have become very chilly indeed if things had depended on him. But before the fire had quite died down, the children's big sister came into the nursery with a rush. Her cheeks were glowing from the wind, and her hair was starred with the snow. Burr! But it is cold even here, she cried, and with one sweep of her arms, the little bright coal scuttle was tipped up and emptied into the grate. How the fire crackled and flickered up to welcome the new coal. Then the children's big sister knelt down on the hearth rug and spread her cold hands over the new blaze. On one of her fingers, a diamond sparkled beautifully in the dancing light. Hail brothers, cried the diamond to the blazing coal. I shall never end my days as you are ending yours. I am too beautiful to be destroyed by men. And yet I am only coal too, and we are brothers. The little rough black coal, who had told his story at this minute, took fire and blazed with a special brightness, and while the flames shot out from him, releasing the sunshine, he spoke for the last time. Oh, this is even better than the singing of the wind in the trees when I was a cone. This is true music. I am living. I am of use. I am singing through all my very self. And where is the singing taking me? I am changing. Only this is swift changing. O oh, Brother Diamond, you must be a diamond for long and long yet. But you too will change. Do not despair or hurry. But I... What will you be? asked the diamond curiously. How can I tell? When we meet again... Then I can tell. Goodbye. The fire blazed redder and redder. The walls of the nursery grew rosy in its light. The children came to the grate and held out their chilled hands, too. They knelt on the hearth, bending closer. How nice it feels! How nice they cried! Then they leaned against their big sister and begged for a story. She laughed, and her kind eyes were all alight in the fire glow. I will tell you the story of coal, she said. It is a wonderful story. Oh, yes, do. Tell us the story of coal, cried the children. Their big sister's stories were always splendid. 
And so the pretty big sister began to tell of the world as it was when the coal forest grew on it. The children leaned towards her and listened with wondering eyes. As for the things, they by now were busy with their silence, and of course never for a minute dreamed that the big sister was telling any story at all, much less the coal's own story all over again. In their silence, they were wishing with all their hearts that the little black coal might come back to tell them what the plan was doing with him now. We will treat the next basket of coal that is brought up with more respect, they said to one another. If coal is little and rough and black, and tossed into the fire as nothing, still it seems to have a heart of sunshine, and to be perhaps a king among things.